So good evening, uh, both to our audience here as well as those who are live streaming this event and happy Chinese New Year. We wish everybody a happy New Year. Um, so I'm going to introduce my wonderful colleagues uh, here. This is Paul Mandolin, uh, Vijay Trussell, Maisak Karimi, and James Lacey. Uh, they are all um, uh, members of the City of Hope family. Uh, they are, um, on, they range from oncologists uh, specializing in medical oncology uh, to all the way to surgical and radiation oncology and we have cancer epidemiology and um, I do science, that's what I do. But let's get right to the, um, to the questions here. And we've got a number of them. And, I'm, and how we're gonna do this is, is actually Think of yourselves as in our living room, and, um, and we're science geeks, and this is how we all talk to each other. So, um, so I'm going to throw out the first question. What, what causes cancer? Who wants to take that? Who wants to start the conversation? What causes cancer? So I think cancer is a combination of multiple factors. So it is surprising that we all don't get cancer at a very young age. Uh, we have nearly a trillion cells in our body and all these cells are dividing. When they divide, they multiply their uh, genes, they multiply their DNA and even if there's a single small mistake in one of these genes, it will create a cell that is uh, abnormal and that will cause things to multiply and multiply and multiply and that's how cancer forms. But the question is, is it the genes that are built in or is it the environment causing these genes to break down at a certain area which causes these abnormal cells? I think it's a combination of both. It's a combination of your genes being abnormal or the environment making the genes abnormal that lead to these cancer cells. So in essence, if somebody were to ask me, where is the inflection point? Where, where does this um, majority of the, the force come from that leads to cancer, I think it would be uh, basically dependent on do you have abnormal genes that you were born with or are these environments causing these abnormal genes? Jim, do you want to add something to that? He is a cancer uh, etiologist and one of the best. So here, he may have a lot to yeah. insight here. I'm an epidemiologist, which means we look for the causes of cancer. So I, of all people, should have an answer to that question. My general answer is all of the above. And what causes cancer, as you said, it's in general a combination of genes, environment, lifestyle, and luck. And what we're now learning as we look into different types of cancers is that for every specific cancer, the specific contributions of each of those things varies. For some cancers, it's mostly genetic. The cancers that we see appear in children, for example, or cancers that really cluster in families, those tend to have genes playing a central role. For other things, lung cancer is a good example. Obviously, environment is the driving factor, and by environment, I mean, I mean cigarette smoke. So that specific combination is going to differ for every cancer type, but the general answer is it's a little bit of each of those things, genes, environment, and lifestyle, and bad luck. So, so that is the part I, I think we have a difficulty to say, the bad luck part. Do we just not know or what does bad luck mean? Bad luck was in the news a lot lately because there was a paper recently that tried to quantify the amount of bad luck. And there's been a lot of discussion among scientists and also in the lay press about whether that paper was accurately described in things like newspapers. Media so reports, Jim, you said like bad luck? Bad luck. And no, bad okay. luck is really just genetic That's bad luck. That's very scientific. <laughs> I, was, I yeah. love this, yeah. So. <laughs> All of our genes are, and our cells are dividing and living and dying and those things. And the body is pretty magical because it has these ways to make sure that all of those cells divide as they should, that the hair keeps growing hair and that the Thank skin goodness. keeps growing skin and that the heart muscle keeps generating. Cancer at the cellular level arises, as you said, when the genes go wrong. When the gas gets turned on and the brake gets turned off, then it can turn into cancer. So we know that at the cellular level, that's the seminal moment. Now what causes the gas to get turned on and the brake to get disabled is a combination of environment, lifestyle, and bad luck. 
the bad luck. Yep. So now we, so that's now a formal scientific term, bad luck. They're the bad luck, whatever's. Yeah. So I have some questions um, that, you know, I do a lot of flying and, um, and invariably when I tell somebody that I'm a cancer researcher, I instantly have best friends, whoever is sitting next to me. And some questions that have, you know, have been actually addressed to me on my flights is, you know, um, I don't have any cancer in my family. No one's ever had cancer. Am I at risk for having cancer? Does somebody want to take that? Uh, I'll take that. I think uh, probably one thing that's really important to remember is uh, when you look at you know, epidemiology, we see most of the time most cancers are not something that we see that's inherited in the family. Uh, that doesn't mean that there is no gene that contributes to the type of cancer, but um, if we look across the uh, population of patients who have cancer, most of them have no family history. So uh, it is a, is a combination, again, of environmental factors that I think we're seeing more and more the, uh, to influence the underlying genetic abnormalities. I think the other thing we've seen is uh, patients who have family history of cancer now, sometimes we see that the cancers develop earlier in life, and I think that also is the effect of environment on some of these uh, abnormal genes. So that's actually an interesting premise. Um, it's something I have actually read about and I've noted myself that, uh, you know, some things like some breast cancers, you know, it, it was always thought, you know, and wrongly, okay, that it's kind of like an old lady disease. And I'm the girl here, so I can say old lady. It was always an old lady disease, but it's really not an old lady's disease. And so I've heard through, the mythology that actually younger and younger women are getting, that more and more younger women are getting breast cancer. Is this true? Well, I think if you still look across the board, we are still seeing breast cancer as being a disease of older women. Uh, you didn't say old ladies, that's good. Yes. <laughs> um, but um, I think we, well, we are probably, we're seeing a little bit of migration of, of an earlier age, but it's still, it still tends to be something that we've seen in the older population. And why do you think that is? Why do you think we're starting to see it in younger women? Well, I, I think, again, I mentioned in the environment and what we do and what our lifestyle uh, has turned into. I think over time, over the last few years, we're seeing significant changes of lifestyle. It's uh, uh, from the type of food to the type of exercise to how active we are and what we do with our lives. I think that probably has something to do with it. Nothing that I can pinpoint one of them being a factor. I think one of the factors that we try to forget is that we have made a big difference in how we detect those cancers. So a, a hundred years back or even fifty years back, we never had mammography that would pick these cancers up earlier. So we may be seeing a blip in that, that we're detecting these cancers earlier, which now would have taken another four or five years in a woman, uh, and we're talking breast cancer specifically, to grow and then you would have had an older age population in that. The stage of the disease that we're picking up now is much lower than the stage of disease that we picked up 20 years back. So I think there may be some confounding factors in that too. Actually, I've got a question for Paul because he's a radiation oncologist. So there was discussion a number of years back about when a woman should actually get her first mammogram. You know, was it supposed to be 40 or 50? And so where did, the, where did everything finally fall out about that? That's a great question. Unfortunately, it's a little bit controversial to this day. <clears throat> um, guidelines usually say around 40 or 50 years old, you should start mammograms when the breast tissue is less dense, so it's easier to image. But if you have a family history of breast cancer or your mother or grandmother or sister had breast cancer, they recommend screening earlier, so maybe about 10 years prior to their diagnosis. So if we're catching cancers earlier, people that are now 40 and 50 years old as opposed to the older population, which is that mammography bias that we get, then we're gonna start screening people that are a little bit younger and we'll catch the next generation earlier. So we add a little bit of bias to what we're doing. Go ahead. You know, that, that brings up a phrase that we often hear. When we'll see a newspaper story about the latest study announcing that this increases the risk of cancer, or another study saying the rates of a certain cancer are going up, and 
almost always those stories will include one of us researchers saying, we need more research. And on one hand, that sounds like a catchphrase, but on the other, you just highlighted the reason for it. Because for many of these components, it's multiple factors at work. And the only way you can sort out the difference between how much are those cancer rates rising because we're screening better for it and we're finding them earlier versus how much are those rates rising because potentially the true numbers of cancers are going up. How much really can we refine that advice we give the 40-year-olds versus the 50-year-olds? When we say we need more research, oftentimes it's we're trying to tease out very specific effects for which we need gigantic data sets. And that phrase, more research, is really just a call for we need larger data to find more precise answers to give better responses when people ask us these legitimate questions. Well, this is not a mythology question, but so tell me about the Jolie effect. <laughs> it is a big effect. And, and I was just going to uh, talk about what David said. I think media, us, uh, everything comes into play and we make, we like to make dramas out of stories. And, and there's no bigger driver of what we as a, uh, as a group of people think than pancreatic cancer happening in somebody who is very famous. And suddenly you'll see that funding for that cancer is, is dramatic. You know, AIDS, for example, was it unless, until uh, some very prominent people got AIDS, both understanding of AIDS and funding of AIDS was abysmal. I think the Jolie effect is becoming two-pronged. One is there's an awareness that people say, uh, okay, I have breast cancer. I am, even if a big star like Angela Jolie had um, bilateral mastectomy and she was open about it, the stigma of the cancer goes away. But it also creates uh, a false impression about genes, for example. Everybody wants to get a BRCA testing done. And it is not that easy. It's not that you get a BRCA testing done, it's positive or negative. There are a lot of these unknowns which are called, you know, there is a little deletion in a gene which is of unknown significance. We don't know what to do with it. We don't want to over-treat and do radical treatments for this. So everybody wants to get a BRCA testing done. And if you take the whole population in the US that has breast cancer, only about two to three percent overall will have a BRCA mutation that would put their other breast at risk, that would put their ovaries at risk. And the other thing it has done is the reconstructive part, which I think is a positive thing, is that most people, uh, most women will want to get reconstructions at the same time and, and there is not a taboo about it. it. It works at multiple levels. So everybody else, so, there's, so the, the number of women who actually have the BRCA uh, de deficiency or deletion or whatever, the okay. mutation. Uh, so they're actually a small percentage. The rest have the bad luck. Is that going back to the bad no, luck? But, but BRCA is not all the story. I mean, if you look at the even inherited cancers, it's not just BRCA. I mean, BRCA is the most studied one and the, probably the most common one. But that's not the only story in the genetic heritage of cancer. Uh, but uh, I think you know, the bad luck is the other part of it, the, the uh, environment that we're exposed to. Yeah. We can't, I don't think we can put 97% of breast into bad luck. So, uh, no. add, it, add it to, let us say, P53 mutation, or uh, Val B4 mutation, or Czech mutation, or BRCA1 and 2 mutation. You're scare. Uh, quit, quit listening. So, so <laughs> that's all I know. I, I can throw these words. Uh, <laughs> okay. but, but the fact is that of that 94 or 95%, there is still a group of people, so let's say before BRCA came out, we would say 100% was bad luck. So now we know BRCA, we say 97% is bad luck. Probably we'll know 10 more genes in the next five years, and we'll say only 50% is bad luck. I think bad luck is a shadow. So our we bad just luck don't is know going what down. is behind it. So our luck is getting better. Uh, in a weird way. Okay. We are understanding it yeah. better. Well, let's go on to some other myths that I know you are all itching to hear about. So this is for you. So do cell phones cause cancer? That's a very popular uh, and common misconception. And that's why we are talking <laughs> about it tonight. So if you watch YouTube, you can see a cell phone popping a piece of popcorn. You can see a cell phone cooking and hard boiling an egg. And unfortunately, that's all fake. You know, we live in the land of Hollywood. So unfortunately, that 
is uh, promulgated through the, the internet and YouTube. But in reality, um, so you don't pop your popcorn with, uh, <laughs> with uh, your cell phone? No. Oh, I was going to try it. Okay. The microwave is still the best. Okay. Or the stovetop. Um, but uh, you have to make a big distinction between the types of radiation. So cell phones, uh, microwave, radio wave, uh, radar, those kinds of things are non-ionizing radiation, meaning that they don't put out enough power, they don't have enough energy to cause those DNA damages or those breaks that cause cancer or can be the focus for a start of cancer. So unfortunately, there's never been a, a hard study that proves that people that use cell phones get more cancers in that side of the brain. Mm -hmm. I mean, some in anecdotal studies will say, oh, there's some people that use cell phones and say they're left-handed and they always get the brain tumors on the left side. When we do larger studies, and that comes into the research part of it, the larger studies should prove that but they don't pan out, which means that there's not a direct correlation, and so it's, it's not panning out to say that there are cancers that are induced by cell phones, or uh, living under high-tension power lines, or microwaving your food, oh, or things please. like that. Thank you about the micro, because that actually was one of those myths that if you microwave your food, and I guess it's because of the con they're thinking about the containers or something, that it causes cancer. Does somebody, so can somebody speak to that about if you microwave your food in a certain kind of plastic, you're liable to get cancer? The general thought is that microwaving releases some chemicals in those plastic containers that can leach into the food. Now, let's think about that. There's a couple steps. You know, what's in the container is bad for you and it gets into the food and then you ingest it and immediately it goes right to whatever tissue is going to do its damage. And then it, it's, I mean, that's one powerful molecule if it indeed does all that. Uh, there are some biochemical reasons that parts of plastic can have some effects on cells, but it's multiple steps and ifs and conditionals to go from that to say microwaving your food is going to cause cancer. And so I agree with you entirely. It's one of those things that it was reported, it got some legs, and as we've looked at it more and more, it hasn't really panned out. The analogy I often use is a football game. Does the team that scores first in the first three minutes of the first quarter always win? No, sometimes the score ends up the other way after you've had 60 minutes to gather more data, make more plays, score more points, things but like that. I don't that. think your, your logic of, and, and I don't have an opinion about the microwave part, but your logic that it is a big molecule that um, will, will seep into the food and will cause cancer. I mean, you need a little stack. I think we're sitting on a precipice. And all these little forces, whether that's a little force from the self, I'm not saying that that is true, first of all, let me make it clear, mm -hmm. that little changes in your body can tip that balance. Correct. And whether the little change is too much estrogen in the milk or too much estrogen in your body or too much ionizing radiation, I mean, it's clear that um, ionizing radiation like a UVA will cause, will, we know that it will uh, cause damage to the DNA in the skin. There's a higher right. incidence of developing cutaneous malignancies, skin cancers, whether it's melanoma, non-melanoma cancers. I think we have to, we have a responsibility as uh, scientists who, who read this data and clear it that we have public um, buy-in, that we are clear about this. There are some things that we are not clear about and we need to keep working on them. Even the headphones, for example, what I do personally is I'll put a, a air phone on my ear rather than use a phone till this, I, I believe that this controversy is resolved, but I don't think everybody does. So talking about environment, you know, I was listening to your conversation. You know, people, some people live under high tension lines and there is the, this thought that somehow living close to power lines is you know, we'll give right. You know, I remember somewhere on Long Island, there was a pocket of people who were getting leukemias, and they were all blaming it somehow being close to these power lines or something like that. So, does one of you want to take that about power lines? It's a a, a myth that comes up often, and it, it's one I've I've thought about because one of my siblings was diagnosed with leukemia as a child, and thankfully he's doing fine now, uh, and he was diagnosed about seven years after we moved to a house that had power lines running in the backyard. And it's human nature to put the two together and say, is this, is this more than just a coincidence? 
Um, but that's where the research can come in and that's where the scientific method can come in. And based on all the data that's been collected thus far, there's nothing to indicate that across the population, everyone who's living close to a power line is significantly more likely to get leukemia than people who aren't living close to a power line. And that's really where we as population researchers can do our best to try to say, what's happening at the population? Are we, do we have enough data to say that here's something that we should clearly tell the public is risky? Or here's something that we can clearly tell the public is safe? As you correctly noted, oftentimes the answer is somewhere in the middle. But power lines and leukemia is one of those where that's leaning much closer to us being able to say that power lines are not a major cause of leukemia. And there's another pattern that I've noticed in a lot of what we were referring tonight to tonight as myths. There tends to be a, uh, a connection between these new exposures and the cancers for which we really don't know what the cause is. Now, when we look at non-melanoma skin cancer, basal cell carcinoma, squamous cell carcinoma, if one of those cancers appears on the cheek of someone with a complexion like me or on the nose of someone with fair complexion like me, that's almost always gonna be a result of sun exposure. For things like brain cancer and leukemia, we really don't have a deep knowledge of what causes those tumors. So when an idea pops up, such as power lines cause leukemia, we do not have a better alternative. And it goes back to sort of that human nature. Well, if someone really thinks that, we can't say, no, in fact, here's the better alternative. So part of this is the onus is on us, as you said, to come up with more information and give people more, uh, a better sense of how these things evolve. We also send a conflicting message. And we, we, it's not just one Absolutely. unit, Actually, I think. I'm glad you're bringing this right. up because we do send a conflicting message out, but go ahead. So I, I mean, so I was going to ask you earlier, do you believe the Erin Brockovich movie, uh, the, which, which happened oh, in Lancaster? Do I, and the, oh, that's a loaded question because when I that movie say, came out, really loaded I was actually, <laughs> I was doing a summer internship testing private water wells for contaminants after okay. the flood in the Midwest. Good, and then let's talk about um, chlorinated water after that. Go ahead. <laughs> the, and some of my research looked at those chlorinated solvents. Now, those things are bad for you. And some of those solvents that were used in dry cleaning years ago are clearly bad for you. And uh, if we went back and dug up some case records, we could say, here's a highly exposed worker whose leukemia or lymphoma was almost certainly due to high occupational exposure to whatever, or drinking water. There are some clear environmental exposures that cause cancer. High naturally occurring arsenic in drinking water can cause bladder cancer. Uh, for those clusters, like the Aaron Brockovich story, the, that's where you're really left in the middle. Right. Because the data are often inconclusive. They're specific events occurring in specific towns. And with luck, we'll identify them and we'll clean them up. So we won't have generations of people exposed to them. And it's hard to get a definitive scientific answer. But so that's where we get the conflict message. Right. We, we tend to take sides. We don't say, right. this data is enough, insufficient for me to make a decision. And let us just see what happens. We take sides. Yes, it did cause cancer, it didn't cause cancer, right. even without adequate I think that's where we fail. And you really get at that, the first question you asked, does something cause cancer? The traditional way we've always answered this is say, what does this potential cause do on the laboratory bench? Mm -hmm. What does it do in cell lines? And then what does it do in mice? And what does it do in other animal systems and rats? And what does it do in humans? And oftentimes, we never have the full range of data. So for something like the environmental contaminants in the water, there's pretty strong evidence from animal models saying these things are bad for you. But we don't have the same quality of evidence in actual human populations to say definitively. And we also have different dosages. The dosages right. that we give to these lab rats are 100 and 1,000 times more. Right. Um, and that would be impossible in practical realm. And I can understand. if I'm. If I'm sitting on the other side of the physician's office and I'm the public, if I'm the, the patient or the patient's family, I'm not the researcher sitting on stage, I would be equally frustrated to hear we just don't know, the science isn't conclusive. 
but when we're wearing our job hats, that's the best answer we can give. I, I understand why it's frustrating and confusing. But there are some things that we do know that Correct. make a difference. You know, covering the skin, mm -hmm. you know, from sunlight. I mean, we know that. That's right. that, that we have, that we understand. But things like these pockets of cancer that show up, sometimes the evidence is, is clear. I mean, your lovely bride gives a, a wonderful thing about this. The, a certain kind of, uh, what was it, a certain nut that is grown in China and they had mold on them and, and but they could really, right, that's it, they yep. could really make a, a strong yep. correlation there, yep. uh, almost a cause and effect. Asbestos. As, as, actually, thank you, actually, mm -hmm. asbestos is a, you know, uh, you know, you, you watch late night TV, all those commercials come up about asbestos, right? Uh, so what about, First, I want to go. I'll come back to asbestos, but actually, before we leave, yeah. about a question about uh, chlorinating water. Just chlorinating water, because this is ingesting chemicals. You know, we're kind of t talking about the whole environmental thing. So, ingesting chlorinated water or bottled water. Now, poor old bottled water is getting 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 hit and saying, "Oh, you 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 know, we're, I don't know. We're going to have to start. I don't know if we're going to start carrying our water in. You know, but." But how about chlorinated water, bottled water? Is there a cancer risk if you brush your teeth with chlorinated water, fluorinated water? You're all looking to me, but I just took a sip of water, so I think I gave away my answer. <laughs> and it was in a bottle. Yeah. I think the most important thing that you mentioned was, was dose. So um, we I did that. Okay, I'm oh, just sorry. kidding. <laughs> so, I mean, the most important thing, though, is, is the dose, because... Um, <laughs> Chlorinating the water is a disinfectant, right? So um, that's the most important, and you have to weigh the risk versus benefit. So if you don't chlorinate the water and all the public water gets infected and people get sick, then your risk is outweighing the benefit of putting some chlorine in it. They've done lots of studies, and unfortunately they did it on our military, with chlorinating their own water for antiseptic purposes when they were overseas. And the amount that they used in these people was probably about 50 times more than what's in the public water, and they didn't have any long-term side effects. So taking that risk is just like you know driving on the 15. You have to get in your car, you have to go to work, um, you kind of have to drink water and brush your teeth. So I think it's important to take everything with a grain of salt. You know, we try our best as professionals and, and leaders in the society to say, it's, it's good to chlorinate the water because we don't want everybody to get sick. But you can't take it too far the other way and say we can't have anything in the water because then we're kind of putting that on the back burner and saying, well, we're going to accept the risk of everybody getting sick because we can't put anything in the water that could potentially be dangerous. Right. How about grilling food? We're in California. We grill all the time. Does grilling your food, your hamburgers and your whatever, is there a cancer association with that? That's one where we can say yes with pretty good definity. Um, grilling meats at high temperatures creates what are called heterocyclic amines, or HCAs. And there's a pretty good amount of scientific data from nutritional studies showing that adults who consume lots of heavily charred meat, so imagine a steak that is black on the top, uh, are ingesting more heterocyclic amines, and those heterocyclic amines do bad things and can increase the risk of certain cancers. So that's one where the, I said, you know, most often we're in the middle. That one is leaning more towards, yes, uh, eating grilled food in moderation is probably much better for you than eating a lot of it. And how about pesticides in food? We're eating, you know, our, our apples look perfectly beautiful, right? <laughs> but what about pesticides in food? We're all looking at you. What do you think? <laughs> That's a good question. I, I'm not. I mean, I'm not really uh, educated on that one. I, but there was a randomized. I shouldn't say a randomized trial, but a, a, but a follow-up of a large population. I don't know the actual number in Northern California, where they looked at organic food versus non-organic food. So we think the non-organic food has pesticides, but it did have, and there was really no increased incidence of the taste might be different. At least it's a placebo effect, right? Well, <laughs> and you can't discount that. I think a placebo effect right. cannot be discounted. It's if I feel right. bad about eating something, 
there may be an environmental, there may be an immunological mechanism that puts my immunity at a slightly lower rate. And as you know, we make thousands and thousands of cancer cells every day. So we are all cancer survivors. This is your quote. That's right. Yeah. That's my quote. I said, we're all, everybody here and everybody watching right now are all cancer survivors. Don't freak out. Your immune system's working really well. Right. So, so I make hundreds of cancer cells every day. And my immune mechanism, like a Pac-Man, finds them and eats them up. If my immunity is depressed, and this happens typically in people who have had a transplant, for example, and we give them steroids, or who have had a bone marrow transplant, or who are on steroids for rheumatoid arthritis or any uh, ulcerative colitis, things like that, they have a thousand times more risk of developing cutaneous malignancies, of developing basal cell squamous cell cancers, or other cancers in the body. So if I feel that something is going to cause me cancer, I may have a slightly increase. I don't know what the number is. I don't know whether it's real. I believe that my immune mechanism is suppressed a little bit, and definitely that proof to the principle can make cancer cells increase in my body. Although I, I think it's very hard to do these type of studies, to, to really be able to control for everything except for the organic and inorganic, or pesticides right. and right. no pesticide. I think it's very hard to do those case control studies, and that's why we, mm -hmm. we need epidemiologic studies, and we, we need to actually look at the population and try to see is there a signal in a certain population who has more exposure. Right. So it's, it's very difficult, I mean, to make those generalized, uh, you know, recommendations, and that's right. why it comes down, we were just talking about that earlier, uh, that, you know, looking at uh, the population who is exposed a lot more to pesticides mm -hmm. compared to the population who isn't. And then over time, look to see, is there certain type of cancers that are more likely seen in those populations? Right. So I, I agree with you. And it takes a long time for those population studies to mature. Right. But we also said the same thing about smoking. So for a long time, because there is so much money behind what we consume, is that both the public and me personally, I am wary of what is being fed to us whether that's being fed by right. industry, whether that's being fed by scientists. And unless we have a clarity on that, it is going to be difficult to convince Correct. people, even people like me. I, I, I think of this as A causing B, where is the data that doesn't right. cause? So smoking, a perfect example. Long time, smoking industry said, no, we, there's nothing that causes cancer. Right. And even now, we have tough time getting that dollar a force out right. of that smoking industry. Right. The, the story of smoking is one that is fascinating, but it's also one that we have already learned from. And I think you're seeing the second iteration of that right now in the debate over sugary drinks and high calorie food. Or and even the, what do you call it, vaping? E-cigarettes. Yep. Vape e e-cigarettes, right, right. yeah. E -cigarettes. And one of the reasons that, that the uncertainty about smoking persisted longer than it should have is the smoking industry was much more strategic and creative in shaping that message than the scientific community was in responding to it. And you're seeing some of those same dynamics play out among the food industry as they try to respond to what's clearly an obesity epidemic that is increasing the risk of a lot of cancers. And at least this time around, led in large part by the folks who have fought smoking for years in public health, they're saying, you know what, this is what we learned in public health and don't get fooled by the same techniques coming from the food industry. Now that's not to say that all of the food industry is bad, but you're seeing a lot of those same things. We'll have a chance to do better sort of the second time around on that one. Is there like a, 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 a one diet that's better than, I mean, you know, because you hear like, you know, you should do the Mediterranean right. diet or versus the paleo diet, versus the Atkins diet, all these very, you know, these names on it. Is there a diet that's better for you to avoid cancer? Yeah. Yes. I know the answer to that. <laughs> so, Leave it to a surgeon. Uh, you know, I think a balanced diet is, is the best diet that there's nothing that you can sustain for a long time. And I, I, Michael Pollan wrote this book. It's, it's one of my uh, Bibles of what I would like to eat. I, I, don't, I can't um, adhere to it because it's very difficult. Not difficult, but it, the, the attractions are difficult in this rush, rush, you, rush. It makes you feel better when you read it so your immune system but goes it's up. A, Go ahead. Eat, 
eat fruits and vegetables often and eat other things that you like that are not, that we know, you know, the, the red meats and the high fat foods and everything else, eat them less frequently. And the biggest problem that I believe in the Western diet is the volume. So if I, whatever diet was given to me, I think it would be a good diet as long as I control the volume. I don't think it should be a diet question and a diet debate, it should be a volume debate. Okay. Well, I, I definitely think the volume is a part of it. Uh, probably the biggest emphasis that was put in the 80s, uh, starting probably from 70s and 80s, is stay away from fat. And you know, so and I, we're I giving the, again a conflict the, message. The, the, the absolutely, now. I mean, I mean, the, the but focus. But I just read, right? Now that eggs and fat are good again. The mm -hmm. egg is bad. That's right. Well, I mean, <laughs> so it, it all <laughs> comes back to a balanced diet. But it's just not all about fat. It's also about the type of protein. Wh where does it come from? And this goes back to the uh, plant-based protein versus the animal-based protein. Um, you probably won't be able to pull any significant epidemiologic studies in the general population, but looking at patients who have had cancer, cancer, real cancer survivors, um, who um, are followed over time and uh, have been randomized to different diets, and there's plenty of data that says certain diets, including a diet that's richer in plant uh, protein and uh, plant nutrients in general, is better uh, than other diets that have higher concentration of uh, animal protein. So that's the dairy and also the, the meats. So, I mean, this is the information that we know, but I mean, there's, there's no one answer, but that is where the Mediterranean diet uh, comes from. Mm -hmm. And just to make sure that we have dinner complete on this conversation, so what about alcohol? Is alcohol bad or good for you? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect answer. Next. <laughs> Alcohol embodies your earlier response, which was right on, and it's a balance of risks and benefits. There, you know, what you said about nutritional epidemiology was also spot on. Those studies, you know, trying to identify, does this specific food increase my risk of this particular cancer? Those are among the hardest types of epidemiology to do. There's a reason I leave them for other people to do. Uh, but there are pretty strong evidence there saying that alcohol will increase the risk of developing certain cancers, including breast cancer among women. We don't quite know exactly how, but the data are consistent enough that women who consume more than two alcoholic drinks a day are at a slightly increased risk of getting breast cancer compared with women who consume fewer than two drinks per day. Now, there are also equally strong data saying that a little bit of alcohol will reduce the risk of heart disease and heart disease kills more U.S. women than does breast cancer. So it's a matter of balancing those risks and benefits. And that balance is going to vary for individual people, for families based on family history, based on personal preferences, things like that. But the data are pretty consistent there. And how about white wine versus red wine? I suppose it depends on whether you're having meat or fish <laughs> in a traditional sense. <laughs> I, I don't know if that makes that much of a difference. I mean, the wine versus beer versus liquor. I mean, it's a, the, there was a study that looked at the uh, breast cancer survivors and, and followed them and showed that actually even less than that. They, they were talking about three drinks per week. That yeah. beyond that, it increased the chance of recurrence of breast cancer in those women who already had breast cancer before. So, and it wasn't really, in, you know, exactly is it, what type of wine is it, or is it a beer? I mean, sometimes we think of beer, oh, you know, I have a six pack a day, that's not an issue. Uh, but it's really, I think it comes down to alcohol. Now, there are other compounds. I mean, we talk about resveratrol, mm -hmm. and, and being, uh, you know, something that's more in, uh, in the wine, red wine. Right, and, right. Uh, there's been a lot of studies that one of the labs You'd I worked at was looking at resveratrol. You'd have to drink a lot of red wine to get that's the right. amount. <laughs> that's right, so I, I mean, I, I don't know if that really makes that much of a difference. Right, and just to finish now, we had our wine course, we've had our dinner course, and now to go to dessert. Does caffeine, can you drink too much coffee? Is there an association between caffeine and cancer? This is the dessert part. Not that we know of, I mean, that's a short answer, but. I had, the, there, was a, yeah. there was like this association potentially with, I think it was pancreatic cancer, there was like mm -hmm. a, some report too much caffeine and pancreatic cancer. And there have been recent studies suggesting that 
women who drink a lot of coffee are less likely than women who don't right. to develop uterine cancer. So cancer Again, uterine. I want to mm -hmm. reiterate, the confounding factors are not very easy to pick up. So right. we said the Correct. same thing Correct. about heart disease. Right. 50 years back we said caffeine is the cause of heart disease right. because we took it in isolation. Caffeine did, if you looked at people who took, drank more caffeine, had a five times, I don't know the actual number, I'm just surmising, five times the risk of developing heart attacks. What we did not take into account is the same people who took five glasses of uh, cups of coffee were the ones who were smoking uh, a two-pack every day. <laughs> right, 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 right. So, so this association, unless looked, and I think this is where I want to focus, is that if you have the proof of principle concept, you can tell me, this is the pathway through which smoking or caffeine or fat is going to cause this cancer. I'm much more logical to believe it rather than throw it into the mix and, um, and focus on that. One of my uh, mentors, uh, back when I worked for a, a federal agency that shall remain nameless because he's still working there, he joked that he was on a mission uh, to prove that coffee was good for you and alcohol was good for you. Uh, he's still very active in research and he's been very productive over the years. Uh, I think he's on very firm footing for the coffee and he can point to coffee and say that most of those reports of coffee increasing risk of this cancer, decreasing risk of another cancer, are probably not good data on which we should be warning people drink more, drink Well, less. we've done a yo-yo with coffee, with every we cancer. Have. One we day it causes have. increase, another day it causes a decrease. So, right. I don't know, maybe... I drink it the Maybe it's day. how you think about it as you're doing yeah. it. Right. But <laughs> one, one, thing, one thing we know of is after dessert, you should go for a walk. Yeah. <laughs> See? Oh, thank you. That led us yeah. nicely into exercise. So the role of exercise and cancer. We're, I, you open, okay, ladies, you don't read the ladies' magazines, but, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of the women's so it's magazines, it's all about the, you do read them. Okay. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's all about, uh, you know, it'll, it's miraculous. Right. But then I also read that there's something about if you exercise too much, you have an increase in cancer. Somebody help me with this, or you all help me with this. What, a, what exercise is, what is, is good for you? What is exercising too much? I think, right. uh, I mean, there's, it's indisputable. Right? There's no question that exercise is, is good for you. Uh, you. You look at a number of studies. I mean, for me, obviously, because I'm an oncologist, the studies that I've looked at are patients who are survivors after breast cancer. And that has been shown uh, that women who exercise on a regular basis have a lower chance of recurrence. There's no question. So that's been proven. Now you can go back to mechanism of, and how does this work? I mean, probably one thing we're sure of is the effect on the immune system, how it enhances the immune system. Not to mention its, its effect on cardiovascular system. And I mean, every organ, every system in the body you think of uh, exercise will make a difference in. So well, in the breast cancer realm, it, it, it is the exercise and the obesity. And, and as you know, that the fat uh, does have more estrogen and the estrogen can stimulate the, it's typically with ERPR mm -hmm. positive cancers that you will have. So weight, which is related to exercise, can be a factor. That could be the proof to the principle. That but also have. even with triple negative breast cancer, now we have data that obesity also increases chance of recurrence. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, I mean, any way you look at it, there's, there's no question. But I think the question is we become fanatics. We become fanatics of food, we become fanatics of exercise, and we go from one extreme to another. It, again, is the balance in life. The balance in life, if my exercise creates a tension in me that I have to wake up at 4.30 in the morning and go and I have to go exercise and do this exercise for an hour and build muscle, I personally think that is going to harm me more then getting up at six and going for a walk for half an hour. There is actually a lot of scientists who are quantifying exercise. Is, uh, it's, uh, there's some unit, I forgot about it, Bob Morgan knows about it much better. It's a unit of how many, uh, how many miles you would have walked during this exercise or what Metabolic equivalents. Metabolic yep. equivalent. I think yep. it's the metabolic equivalent of yep. how much bicycling is equivalent right. to how much. So we need to have an optimal uh, exercise pattern which is not going to stress me. I, I would rather not exercise than get stressed. I think the stress causing me to decrease my immunity is going to be worse for me. Absolutely. 
So, in a way, so talking about fanaticism, are there supplements? Because there are people dropping, I, I was reading an article about people taking supplements, you know, extra vitamins and all kinds of unusual herbs and things like this. I mean, this is a multi-billion dollar industry. Are there any magic supplements now that we should take and some that we shouldn't take? There are magic supplements. Whoa! I've seen them. <laughs> you are hearing so, it first. <laughs> so I saw this, uh, <laughs> there was this movie where, uh, and this is true, this is not just a movie, that their supplements contained uh, uh, th thyroid hormone. And you are so up uh, <laughs> all night and you are exercising, your heart rate is going 120. Uh, you have a heart attack. You're, and, and you lose weight on those supplements. We don't have a regulated industry. That is my, my worry about this, is that you can put anything. If you have to go to FDA nowadays and, and send aspirin through the FDA, it would not get approved. That is how regulated that industry is. And I believe that there are multiple supplements that are very helpful, but in that hundred supplements that are very good, there's a million others that are being sold at a high price and we don't know which ones are which. Until it gets regulated, I am really wary of supplements. Actually, that's, uh, isn't that the, um, actually, some of, some of these supplement companies actually prey on people who are ill, mm -hmm. which is really bad. And, and, and we see the other end of it. I, I can tell you in the last week, I saw two people who had gone to Mexico and uh, said there's this amazing diet somebody is putting hydrogen peroxide IV. That is what they were using. And in the end, all it did was delay. I, I can't say it increased the cancer, but there was a delay of three to four months time, which is not a huge delay, but it's a delay enough to cause the cancer go from stage one to stage two. And if you are diverting mm -hmm. your focus on treatment and going supplemental ways, I think that can hurt you. I, I still think that we need to have, and we do have at City of Hope, a uh, complementary alternative medicine program which needs and is looking at these supplements to see how can we enhance this. The other problem with supplements that I see is that it's not that it is harmful all the time, but we don't know what it does to our treatments. If somebody's getting chemotherapy. I'm glad you brought this. Yeah. I was going to ask you this with your patients. Uh, I was going to ask them with their patients because very often, you know, you'll have someone going through treatment and they fail to tell their uh, oncologist actually that they are dosing themselves with all kinds of supplements and it has an effect actually on on their treatment. I'd love for you to Absolutely. talk about I mean, this. This is what I, I try to make a point of this, uh, uh, you know, in the first in the initial meeting, that I need to know uh, what any type of supplements, it doesn't matter if it's herbal, it's a tablet, wh whatever it is, we need to know uh, what it is. It's not, uh, and I'm not being judgmental, right? and I explained that to them. Maybe we don't know how good some of these are and how bad some of these are. It doesn't matter. That's not the point. Mm -hmm. The point is, if the patient is receiving systemic chemotherapy, we want to make sure that it will not affect, downgrade the effect of the treatment. And, and that's been shown, actually, Absolutely, to do that. absolutely. I mean, there are websites, uh, uh, and there are several websites that are really good in this to take a look at the interaction between some of the uh, chemotherapy drugs and some of these herbal medications. I've had patients whose, uh, you know, some of the blood tests as we're, we're going along, liver function tests start going up and said, um, then we start asking and said, oh, well, I'm, I'm taking this liver cleanser. And uh, when we look into that, it actually interacts with the chemo and we stop the liver cleanser and the liver enzymes come back down. So, mm -hmm. especially during treatment, I make a very big, you know, it's a big deal uh, out of this. After we're done with the treatment, I, I, th I think, you know, you could do what you think is right. Because uh, I, I can't tell them if it's right or wrong. But during the treatment, I always say we need to know to make sure there's no interaction. It's also, I think Paul will attest to this, that in radiation, uh, if you're taking antioxidants, it will have some impact of neutralizing the radiation. Right. I mean, that's, it's a little bit of a, of a theoretical point. Um, I tell people, again, I want to know what supplements you're on. And a regular multivitamin a day is fine, or there are your regular vitamins that you need, calcium, vitamin D, those kinds of things. But um, if you're taking every single bottle that you take is super high in antioxidants, that can um, 
basically decrease the effectiveness of treatment. Because in the theoretical world, if you're taking mega doses of antioxidants, that's the way radiation is working, as it's creating free radicals, which are damaging to the cancer cells. Antiox <coughs> antioxidants are free radical scavengers. So they're protecting the cancer cell then, actually taking them at exactly. that Exactly. Right. So that's the theoretical point. And again, you would have to be taking mega doses right before radiation because the effectiveness of radiation is done in milliseconds. You know, the radiation's on off and it's done and the effects then take a while to repair and the DNA has to repair itself. But if you're not letting us make that damage permanent and kill the cancer cells, then you could theoretically be decreasing the effectiveness of treatment. So why do you say mega doses? Why not micro doses? Are, are doses that are above the normal limits that we take? Well, again, most people that are taking the supplements, I don't think they're taking the regular standard doses, which is what I would consider a, a standard mm -hmm. multivitamin or something that has some antioxidant properties in it, like vitamin C. If every single bottle that you're taking is uh, super high in kale or super high in antioxidants and, you know, red fish oil and something like that, then I think that's when we get a cumulative effect and that's when I become more nervous as opposed to you're taking a regular multivitamin to help out with health, then I think that's much better tolerated. So this hydrogen peroxide thing that you, that I these people it. are, not, not you, but that people are traveling to go get and it's not really, is it supposed to be like acidifying them or something? Because there's all this thing about, you know, if I'm a too acidic in my diet that will promote cancer or so, is that what they're trying to do or, or deacidify you or something? That is what they promote. Right. But you... There are people who are downing tons of what is it, sodium bicarb? Is that what it is? Or, or baking soda you know or something how, like that every day? How closely regulated the pH of the body is? It is regulated between 7.35 to 7.45. If you go down 7.25, it's a threat to your life. Uh, leave alone cancer. Cancer may take, you know, 10 days, uh, not 10 days, uh, it may take, uh, you know, a year to get to the point where it will cause impact on me. But this thing is going to kill me if I drop down that pH. So you're not dropping down the pH at all. It's not that you're drinking bicarbonate. Your body has such a great mechanism of neutralizing that, that your pH in your, in your blood is still regulated 7.35 to 7.45. Yeah, because there are websites that are doing this bacon soda yeah. kind of, and they, they, they take it several times a day. And um, yeah, so yeah, we're highly, our, it, we maintain I, I, our I, pH. I don't know if it, it it certainly does not change the, the blood pH. There, there's no question. It's not going to affect that. Uh, as was mentioned, I mean, the, your kidneys do a very good job of regulating that. Uh, whether it will affect what you absorb and because it's going through the gut, I don't know that. I mean, that, that, may, that may be one thing that they could. But we do know about. one thing is that if my, my stomach acid is, is neutralized, I have a much higher risk of getting, uh, getting infections. That much we know. So people who have bowel obstruction, who are on proton pump inhibitors, which decreases your stomach acid, their bugs in their stomach are alive. So if I say Ooh, that is... Bugs in the stomach. Oh, oh, remind I me, I want to talk about this. No, but that, this, is, this is a very important point. And it's not just about infections, it's also about absorbing some nutrients. Right. Higher pH, which is caused by the proton pump inhibitors, does reduce the amount of absorption. I mean, we do run into this. I do, you know, being a hematologist also, we, we have some patients who mm -hmm. have a difficulty absorbing iron from food. And uh, it is not 100% proven, but you certainly see at least a loose correlation between these drugs uh, that affect the pH of the stomach and absorption of iron. Microbiome. This is like, I... I, I Cultured yogurt. I am just amazed by how people are, are, you know, there are scientists studying it. You know, you go in the supermarket and they got probiotic and talk about this a little bit. And, and the, bu the bugs, we call it the bugs, okay? They're not real bugs, okay? I mean, not, well, we, they're, never they're, mind. They're good bugs. Yeah, they're, okay, they're good bugs. They're going <laughs> to tell you all about this. But, you know, our bugs Actually, I was talking to a scientist who's really doing this microbiome, and he goes, every time you eat, you're feeding your microbiome, and, and you should ask yourself, are they happy? So I'd like to talk <laughs> a little bit about this, actually. There's, 
There's no question. I mean, it's a symbiotic relationship. There, there are actually so studies. So tell them what the bugs are, just in case they're not. I mean, they're good, uh, good bacteria. I mean, we, we all have it. We all run into this issue. Our, our, our gut, some parts of our gut has uh, bacteria that are helpful to our digestion. And uh, so what happens a lot of times, you've noticed that some, some patients who receive white spectrum, it's very strong antibiotics that kills all of those good bugs or bacteria end up getting infected with the bad bugs, with the bad bacteria that cause a lot of problems. Uh, so there's, there's no question that the microbiome is uh, very, very important. And, uh, and that's, that's one of the reasons, again, that's important. We talk, I just mentioned cultured yogurt and probiotics and those type of things. But that's uh, from healthy eating. You should be able to get those. It's a hot area of research lately, in part because we didn't realize the importance of it before. And so now a lot of attention is rightfully being directed toward the role that microbiome might have in specific cancers. And I know we're, we're coming up towards the end, but it's, it's a good reminder that as we dive into uh, new topics like microbiome, there's still a lot we know about how people can reduce their risk of cancer and indeed prevent it. Good, We've talked about some of the fringe items, but there's but, a long list of things we should all be doing. And that's what we're going to end on, actually. I wanted to say, because, right. you know, I don't want, I don't, if anything, I don't want them to be confused and going, well, what the heck are my, am I supposed to do? Can you uh, talk to what we know that is real that we can actually do right. to help ourselves if we have cancer as well as our wellness from cancer? Many items on that list are so familiar, we take them a little bit for granted. Don't smoke. If you smoke, try to quit. If you don't smoke, don't start. Be active. Get physically active. Eat a varied diet. Know your family history. This is one that most of us underestimate, but take some time to find out what your family history of cancer is. That can help your clinician gauge whether you're at a higher risk of certain cancers or others. When you're out in the sun, use sunscreen. Wear a hat. Right. Put out some sleeves. Right. So I think that would cover probably 90% of the preventable. There are some things that I have no control over. The genes that I got from my parents, the uh, damage I did to myself through sun damage over the last 16 years, I don't have control over that. But those things, I think they would cover 90% or more of what is preventable. Yeah. And good luck. <laughs> and good luck. And, and everything in moderation. Yeah. You in know? moderation. <laughs> so everything our, our, our mom told us right. is true. Is true. Well, yes. I want to thank you so much. I want to thank the audience um, uh, for your participation. I want to thank all those who are watching us on the live stream. Um, and I want to thank my wonderful panelists here. I've had a lot of fun with them. I could hang out with them for the rest of the evening and talk. Uh, thank you so thank you. much. Thank you, Linda. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.